Hey, deserving listeners, it's time for me to react to your comments from my videos from last week. Let's get to it. The ultimatum, Teresa says, or Teresa says, for Nate, it kind of felt like everybody else who he was inclined to pick, they picked someone else and he didn't want to be the last one left alone. So he rushed to propose to Lauren to avoid that situation. Yeah, so there are a lot of comments about this and what it comes down to is what do we believe was in Nate's mind and what were the factors and what were the weights to the factors. On one hand, you could say that he cynically asked Lauren to marry him because he was terrified of being left alone and didn't want that humiliation or he didn't want Lauren to be with Colby and he suddenly realized he doesn't want to be on this TV show and he didn't really want to marry Lauren. He didn't really want to compromise about his uh, life goal of having kids. He was just in the moment faking a proposal to avoid humiliation and jealousy. That's one perspective and that could be true. We can't know because we'd have to be inside of his head. On the other end of the spectrum, you could say that he was already seriously considering marrying her, Lauren. He was already seriously considering changing his mind about kids or at least compromising around that. And yes, the factor of being left alone, the factor of Lauren being with someone else uh, probably played a role, but the majority of his proposal was legit and absolutely in line with what he wants. We saw Lauren's reaction. She absolutely wanted him to do that. It's hard to say. Now, I think a lot of people are, at least commenters, are in the first camp where it, it he's some sort of faker and he is a liar and he is insecure and he just did it for those reasons. And yeah, your, your uh, you know hypothesis is as, as good as any other. Listener Juna from Central Asia emailed in using our website form and says, thank you so much for your commentary on Danielle from Love is Blind. So she's talking about watching Danielle Love is Blind reaction that I did last month. Her and Nick's issues are an eerie mirror of my relationship with my husband and your commentary is so illuminating and helpful to us. My husband and I have been stuck in this cycle of him feeling scared to open up about his feelings, then working up the courage to be vulnerable. But when he does, something in his words triggers my trauma and I feel extremely hurt, which causes him to close up and regret trying to open up, which inevitably leads to me feeling horrible and so on. I got into therapy recently and I've been trying to suggest my partner do as well, but he refuses and says all his problems stem only from the issues in our relationship. I understand that I cannot, oh, by the way, I have a thing on my face right here. I was at the dermatologist the other day and he burnt or froze something off my face. So that's what that is. <laughs> I thought about putting a, a Band-Aid over it, but I thought, well, that probably even looks worse. And I thought, well, maybe people just think it's like a cute be beauty mark or something. And Like, did Marilyn Monroe have one of those? Anyway, um, I understand that I cannot force him to go to therapy, but at the same time, this makes me feel like something's wrong with me and only me, and it's pushing me into this perpetual cycle of feeling worthless. Is there anything you could, is there anything you could talk about here that could help, that could be of help? Yeah, well, Juna, I'm glad that you had some self-awareness when I was reacting to the video. It pr prompted you to go to therapy. A lot can be done with that. A lot of good could come from that, not only for yourself, but from your relationship. The second issue of, so I would continue to do that. And even if you feel like, well, wait, why am I the only one in therapy? Uh, this notion that you're the only one to blame is ridiculous. This notion that you're worthless is ridiculous. You're just the one that is ready to go to therapy. He is not ready to go to therapy. Now, there's a possibility that he sees things in a wrong way. You know, I often will hear that from people like him that will say, well, the only reason why we're fighting is because of you. And so you go to therapy and we'll all be okay. And in reality, he has just as many issues as you do, if not more, but because of his attachment insecurity, it's harder for him to admit that. It might take longer for him to reach the point where he's ready to go to therapy. Men are socialized to avoid vulnerability and therapy as an extension of that. So it can be much harder for men to take that leap. 
So there's a lot of reasons why that happens. And that's just the way that it is. You can't make someone go to therapy. There's a lot that you can do in therapy for your relationship and for him, even though you're just in therapy. I work with some people in your situation and I will talk with them about not only their issue, you know, my client's issues and how they can react in a more healthy, differentiated way with their partner, but I also tell them how they can inform their partner how, what might also help. It's important that I, as a therapist, am not biased towards my client completely and believe this narrative that their partner is completely to blame. So I have to imagine what's really happening and, and what the other partner might say if I were to meet them, but it can be done. So, you know, this notion that of worthlessness that's emerging in you is probably from your childhood and it's just being triggered by this scenario. The other thing that I'll say is even in couple therapy, when I'm talking with someone, when I'm, when I'm working with a couple and we're talking with one person in particular, uh, which, which will happen, there can be that thought as well. You know, I'm working with a couple and one person's issue seem to be more relevant or something or I just go down a decision tree of like, well, let's, let's really spend the whole session working on this one person. It's natural for that person to feel like, wait, am I completely to blame? And that, that is a logical fallacy that somehow if we're working on one person's issues, they're to blame for everything. That, that, that's not, it implies that if there's something wrong with you, you're supposed to go to therapy. <laughs> it implies that if you are, I don't know. Anyway, you get my point. So uh, it, now as a therapist, I will adjust for that. We'll be like, even if I f will say, this doesn't mean this is all your fault, by the way, you understand that? even if they kind of believe me, it's a good idea to kind of spread it around a little bit. But uh, there are times, given what the issues are at stake, given what will help the most, given who's ready to talk about their issues, that we might spend months really focusing on one person more uh, and having the other person help out in that way. And that's just the way therapy is going to go. And, and to attach a meaning to that, like somehow that person is more problematic is problematic. Um, comments to my comment video from last week. So we're getting super meta. <laughs> I'm commenting on a reality TV show and then posting it on the internet. Then you're commenting on my comments and then I commented on your comments and now you're, and then you commented on those comments and then now I'm commenting on those comments that you made about my comments, about your comments, about my comments, about the reality TV show. Brandilyn says, Dr. Honda, I'm a medical provider in Seattle and truly appreciate your commentary. You've certainly helped me better understand my patients and myself since I started viewing. Much appreciation to you. Well, Brandilyn, medical provider in Seattle, glad to meet you and uh, that's great. I, I like hearing from other professionals. Uh, Karina says, yes, I have taken notes. Right. So I was talking, I was like, do people take notes? Because I wouldn't be surprised. And Karina says, yes, I have taken notes quite a few times. As a result, I found a new therapist who specializes in attachment theory. Good for you, Karina. That is great, actually. Uh, Dogs says, man, the ADHD stuff feels so right on. I was talking about ADHD. I'm 40 now and was only finally diagnosed last year after trying to treat bipolar 2 for 20 years. I've spent a large meaning that they were perhaps misdiagnosed with bipolar 2, which can happen. I've spent a lot, a large portion of my teen and adult life believing that my inability to complete banal tasks or classes was a moral failure and that I was lazy. Now that I understand what ADHD really is, how it affects executive function, and finally getting treated properly. It's been utterly life-changing. I don't feel like I'm lazy anymore. Uh, I don't feel like a, I don't anymore feel like a lazy, flighty piece of crap for the first time in my adult life. I'm so glad for you dogs, that's, that's great. Um, yeah, you deserve that. And it's really a tragedy that we've understood in the clinical world what ADHD is for decades and yet we still aren't managing to put the word out, which is part of the reason why I do this YouTube channel. Mel says, it's not bold face lie. So right, I, w I, said, I said bald face lie in a video, then someone commented and said, that's not the right idiom, it's bold face lie. And I talked about in the last comment video, now Mel is saying, no, it's not bold face lie. You were right at, at the beginning that it's a bald face lie. It has something to do with old timey times with 
being able to catch someone in a lie easier when they don't have a beard or something like that. Oh, so I was originally right. That surprises me. So it's bald face lie and not bold face lie. All right. Um, I'm sure I'll screw it up in the future anyway. Teresa says, I have taken notes before as I'm a new therapist and I love learning from you. I took notes about differentiation and put a note for myself to, to do some more reading about attachment theory and Bowen. I remember learning about these topics and Bowen's theory in grad school, but it wasn't in depth enough. Yeah, grad school is an introduction to an introduction. A lot of people who go to school or who are about to go to school or who recently graduated will have this notion that somehow graduate school is the education that you need to be a clinician and an effective, really solidly foundationed, uh, you know, to have a f solid foundation that all you need is to go to graduate school, maybe a little bit of continuing it after school. N no, absolutely not. My ability to be a therapist and my knowledge about therapy and humans and theory and practice and ethics and professionalism and DDD has 99% been developed after grad school, outside of grad school, because I did my own personal exploration, reading, supervision, experience, podcasting. When I podcast, it gives me a chance to go in depth on things. and. If you even happen to come across attachment theory in graduate school, in all likelihood, you got just the bare minimum that kind of helps you to maybe take a test on attachment theory, but definitely doesn't give you the knowledge that you need to help your clients and help yourself. Uh, that's where more in-depth knowledge comes in for sure, which sucks, you know, because it's like you're you're, you're always at a deficit of knowledge throughout your entire career, but it's glorious because there's always something to learn. Gino and Jasmine video, listener Franzi, she says, I totally get why Jasmine would be attracted to Gino even though he's less attractive, conventionally attractive than she is. This is a dynamic I've experienced in my own life. I have been dealing with abandonment fears and terrors my entire life. A less attractive man represents security. He is less likely to be snatched up by another, and he will not likely find an even more attractive woman than me. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. I mean, if that's true, which we wouldn't know, for Jasmine, that would fit with what seems to be preoccupied attachment. Marsu says, I dated a liar like Gino, and it was the most frustrating thing I've ever done in my life. He would lie about everything, about taking out the trash, about drinking coffee or not, etc. It just made me totally insane. Yeah, pathological liars are confusing and will drive you bonkers because you're like, why would you lie about that? <laughs> like, what are you doing? But it's a compulsive defense. Madison says, I have to, I have a take care of yourself hoodie and I can confirm I get similar. So I was talking about how, oh, by the way, I'm wearing this. My cat wants to chime in. Stacy Podwife painted this and then scanned it and made it into a thing. This is to commemorate Michelle, my cat that died. Um, last year two years ago last year two uh anyway um so the take care of yourself because you deserve it madison has a hoodie and i was talking about how when i was out and about with that shirt i get comments people are like oh that's so positive like just randos just like people commenting on it and madison's saying that she gets the same reaction uh danielle and mohammed robin says the loneliness thing hits home. So I was talking about loneliness. I work from home every day I wake up, stay in my house alone, go to sleep and repeat. I call my family sometimes. I have Zoom calls once a week with close friends, but not having people around me in my daily life is incredibly hard. Sometimes I find myself lying on the floor just thinking about how isolated I feel. Yeah, we have this notion in our American society to some extent that living alone and having I mean, we wouldn't call it an isolated life, but we might call it like a productive life or a simple life or something where you're living by yourself and you don't have people in your life frequently. We have this notion that somehow that, that's healthy, that somehow you can manage, and we can't. It makes sense, right, that we evolved in a, for hundreds of thousands of years within other, you know, when we were, say, previous species of primates even before that, that we 
were born into a tribe and stayed in that tribe throughout our entire life and died in that tribe. And we were never far away from that tribe. We didn't wander off into a cave by ourselves for five months. We were probably always within eyeshot of at least a few people, if not dozens of people. And it makes sense that that environment is conducive to our emotional attachment health. And when you lack that over time chronically, there's going, there are going to be emotional effects in the same way that we see that when we lack nature in our life, because we grew up in nature and we're in these boxes, concrete, um, you know, uh, manufactured boxes, that we also see on average an effect over time in our energy level, sleep, mood, um, you know, all those kinds of productivity because they do these same kind of things at work that they will have office buildings with no plants or no window to look out and there's lower productivity. Uh, so it's, and which is obviously a product of mood and all the kind of motivation, that kind of stuff. And yeah, so now Robin, I'm not shaming you. I'm just saying that we all need to go on a campaign to set up our life so that we are living with other, uh, living with other people. I mean, it depends, but take into consideration. So I find that in American mainstream culture, we tend to overemphasize boundaries and convenience. So, you know, if you're living with five other people, there are going to be conflicts, right? You're going to get in each other's way. They're going to be loud when you want to be quiet and vice versa. You know, there's annoyances that you run into. And the common solution is we well, got to get a better job so you can afford a, so you can get more money so you can afford your own apartment. And that might be the answer. And believe me, I was there when I was in my 20s and I had roommates. Uh, I couldn't, well, I, I knew at the time that if I went and lived on my own that I would never live with roommates again. I, I remember thinking that. I was like 25-ish or something. And I remember thinking, once I cross that line into living by myself, I'm guessing I'm never going to want to live with roommates because I'm going to like it too much. But I but I like living with roommates and having that dynamic socializing. But then I had this one roommate who, <laughs> I'll tell this story. So I came home from work and I walk in the house and um, that my roommates were, you know, lounging about watching TV. And in the kitchen, I was with a friend and in the kitchen was a pan of brownies. And we were like, oh, you made brownies. And they're like, yeah. And so my friend picks one up and starts to you know, eat it. And I'm like, well, I don't really want a brownie. And we're, walk we're walking back through the living room and uh, joining everyone. And the, my friends say, they're like giggling. And they say, yeah, those are magic brownies. You know, they're pot brownies. And I'm like, a uh, what? <laughs> you... And my friend luckily was like, oh, okay, I'm guessing it, I'm getting high now. <laughs> I'm guessing in 20 minutes I'll be high as F. So, all right, I guess so. But for me to have someone jokingly drug someone and, you know, it's not the end of the world. It could be though, but that level of trust and that just, and it, there were other instances of other substances and whatnot just so that's what pushed me over the edge i'm just like no get me out of here <laughs> like if i can't trust a friend a roommate to have the wherewithal to consider someone else's life and health to hey by the way those are pot brownies um then what can i also not trust there was another thing that happened as well that we had decided that once a month, this is how disgusting we were. And we, I had uh, women roommates as well who were even more disgusting uh, on the spectrum, but we had agreed there was this bathroom downstairs and there were two bedrooms downstairs. And so me and my other roommate downstairs decided that once a month we would wash the bathroom. <laughs> Just imagine that. Um, and we had parties and there were lots of dudes and it's just, it was gross. I mean, just, you know, you can picture it. 
uh, fast, by the way, fast forward five years or so, and I'm a therapist and I'm actually practicing in my house and my clients would use my bathroom. You better believe I became very meticulous about my bathroom. And now I'm like very meticulous about my bathroom. So it's kind of weird for me to think about that time. But anyway, so we had agreed once a month. And so I washed it one month and then the next month comes and you know, every week that goes by, I'm like, is he gonna clean the bathroom? It's getting grosser and grosser. And then the, the month passes and I go to him and I'm, I say, so it was your turn to wash the bathroom last month. I, I, don't, wanna, I, don't, I don't mean to be a jerk face, but you, know, you, you have to clean it. And he's like, yeah, no. I'm like, uh, what, do you, what do you mean? No, like not today. What do you, he's like, nah, I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> I just thought, uh, do you have a follow up to this? Or is this a dot, dot, dot? And you're going to say, because I have an allergy to bleach or like what, what's the explanation? There was nothing. And I thought, and I, this is a good friend of mine and he, but you bump up against people's issues when you live with them. And so I, that was another issue. I was just like, get me out of here. And so I got out of there and then I never looked back with roommates. <laughs> I never had another roommate again. Anyway, point is, is that consider for your life what your mental health is and don't overemphasize boundaries with people at the expense of your own attachment needs. Because having someone, and it's it's weird because it's imperceptible. It's not like when you're living with someone and you, you know, a roommate or a partner that you wake up in the morning with knowing that they're, that they're in the house with this very visceral sense of the enrichment that that gives you. It's not like you wake up and go like, what a day, I have a roommate. Like it doesn't, it, it's not noticeable, it's, it's slow over time. And the markers are feeling lonely. And as you say, Robin, lying on the floor, just thinking about how isolated you feel. <laughs> you know, it, it, it takes a toll. And I would imagine that people, I've seen people get kind of emotionally raw and when someone doesn't text them, they become more preoccupied attachment wise. They become more like, does anyone want to be with me? How come no one's getting back to me? What's happening here? So now, you know, sometimes there are huge barriers to all this stuff and, and there's all that, but you know, just something to think about. We always have to criticize or scrutinize our culture and how it is breaking us. Kim Newsman, Camilla says, I think that I think that everyone's entitled to their own lifestyle. So there's talking about polyamory or polygamy. Um, I think that everyone's entitled to their own lifestyle as long as they're being safe, but I felt a little uncomfortable at the idea of someone encouraging a monogamous person to try polyamory because they want it. Maybe it's because I've read so many sad stories of people wanting monogamy in a relationship, yet going along with polyamory to keep their partners happy and ending up in confusing, hurtful situations, doesn't it make the most sense for people to be with someone who also shares their lifestyle? Yeah, so in the video, I believe I was talking about how in relationships, sometimes the Usmans will be in, uh, introducing or off or requesting that the relationship become open. Now, of course, in this situation, is it okay for Kim to be with other people? Uh, people are pointing out in Usman's culture, the answer is absolutely no, but we don't know. For Usman and Kim, we don't know their arrangement. Um, the other thing I'll say is there are polyamorous relationships where one person is with other people and the other, peop and the other person is not. I've, I've, had I've had clients like that where the wife will be polyamorous and have other relationships of, of a certain level of intensity and the husband will not because he's not oriented that way. He, he never really wanted that in his life, but he doesn't uh, mind. He's okay with the wife being polyamorous. It's not his first choice, but you know, take the good with the bad and, and, and he, can, he can deal with it. There's a lot of conversations about consent from the husband. There's a lot of conversation about, is this truly what he wants? How is it affecting him? All that stuff. And it's a negotiation and it requires a lot of care, a lot of compassion towards each other. And, and I've worked with people like that. So um, now if you go on the internet and particularly, I guess, if you hear anecdotes, 
there's a good chance that a lot of the stories about polyamory are what you're talking about, Camilla, where essentially one of the partners is trying to cheat and doesn't really have a lot of compassion for their partner and is just trying to have their cake and eat it too and they're callous about it and they're uncaring. And that is not the polyamory way, <laughs> by the way. The polyamorous, the true polyamorous people that I've uh, worked with and, and the people that, that train polyamory, if you will, will say, that's not okay. You, you, you have to have tremendous amount of compassion and you have to consider other people's feelings. And if breaking up is required, then you should do that. You shouldn't string someone along. You shouldn't try to gaslight someone into being that way or manipulate someone into being that way. Now I'm using the word wrong. Anyway, so um, what you're saying, Camilla, is that everyone's entitled to their lifestyle, but the idea of someone encouraging a monogamous person to try polyamory doesn't seem very fair. And yeah, if, well, so if it's manipulative or pressuring or it is preying on someone's dependence on you, then yeah, that's not okay. But that's not always the case, of course. There are many situations where, like let me give you a typical example, where two people, they get married, they love each other, secure relationship, and then 10 years into the relationship, let's just say, I'm actually thinking of a friend of mine actually, the wife will say, ah, you know, I, I'm, over time realizing I really need to be with other people. I, I either have to, I don't want a divorce because I love my husband, but I am going stir crazy. I can't be monogamous. I have to have some experiences outside of this situation, you know, whether it's sexual or romantic or, you know, flirty or something. And maybe there are some small dalliances. You know, she goes out with her friends. There's a little bit of flirting. She gets a phone number. She's drunk. She comes home and she's like, oh my God, what am I doing? I said, no. In exploration, maybe in therapy, it's like, oh, you know what? I think I might be polyamorous. And then the woman starts to explore that, maybe read some books. And then she goes to her husband and says, hey, what do you think about, you know, introduces the topic. And there are conversations of, is it threesome? Is it her just being someone else? Is it both of them dating another couple that is also into that kind of level of, of relationship? Because there's all sorts of different levels of polyamorous relationships, right? Whether it's just a one night fling or a full on relationship uh, where it's just like being, a, it is a partnership. So now for him, how does he feel about it, right? Is he being manipulated and pressured? Does he does he feel like he has a choice? Is someone there supporting him saying, look, if you don't want to do this, you can give her an ultimatum and say, look, either you don't do this or we have to break up because I don't want to do this and I don't want you to do this. But if you have to do it and you're willing to give up our relationship, then that's the only way this is going to work. So the person being encouraged or the person being presented to, if you will, they have to have enough support and enough differentiation and enough connection with their own needs to be able to navigate that because it's a pretty wild path to go down, you know, especially if you're not oriented polyamorous wise. If you are a monogamous person and if someone's coming at you with that, what do you do with that? It's, it's a very... It, it takes a long time, and that's why polyamorous people in my office are very good communicators because that scenario could literally take five years of therapy before anyone does anything outside of the relationship. That's how it usually goes. But when you hear about stories, you know, it's some dirtbag who is like, I, I cheated a few times and I didn't tell my wife, and so and I'm starting a relationship with someone, so I'm introducing the idea of polyamory when I just don't know what's going on with me and I have an alcohol problem. You know, those things happen too. That's not polyamory though. That's not ethical non-monogamy. That's unethical non-monogamy. And it's very different. So it's complicated. <laughs> Destiny says, love this episode. I've been with my partner since I was in high school, 10 years now, and sometimes I feel like I'm missing out on sexual experiences. So Destiny is sounding like uh, they want 
they're starting to have that the very similar experiences what I was describing earlier. I sometimes feel like I'm missing out on sexual experiences. My partner and I have discussed the possibility of an ethical non-monogamous relationship in the future. It's scary, but I feel like I want to explore what's out there, and I know I would feel safe doing so, knowing my partner is by my side. Problem is, I don't know how I would feel if he would fall in love or deeply like someone. It would probably hurt me. It's just a confusing place to be in that it makes me just want to push down the fantasy and re and remain monogamous. Yeah, so let me talk about that for uh, briefly because it's complicated. But you can, there, there are a lot of different options and usually it evolves over time. The polyamorous people that I've worked with have very distinct chapters in their life where, it, you know, in one chapter there's like 20 people in their polycule and then a the next chapter there's no one, just the two of them. And another chapter, they're living with another couple. And another chapter, you know, it, it, it changes over time. So uh, I'll say that. The other thing I'll say is that jealousy, it's not, it's not not present with polyamorous couples. Most polyamorous people experience jealousy. They experience that worry. It's what we do with the worry, right? And the high functioning polyamorous people have a very effective way of dealing with that jealousy and talking about it but it's it doesn't feel good it it, it, can, it can it can be hurtful and there could be worries there so there's that and there's a whole field of discussion around that and care around that like one of the ideas that polyamorous people often talk about is what they call nre or new relationship energy and this idea is a way of understanding your intense feelings when you first uh, like someone. And they will sort of compartmentalize that a little bit. So for example, a high functioning polyamorous couple, one person is out dating and they start to have that intense love and they're just like, I don't even wanna be with my partner. I don't just wanna be with this person. Uh, high, high functioning polyamorous people will frame that, the, the individual falling in love will frame it as new relationship energy and say, oh, I'm having a lot of NRE right now. And they'll, they'll talk about it that way. And they'll say, it feels good, but I don't want to make any rash decisions based on NRE because that's, that's what happens in the beginning of a relationship when you meet someone that's compatible with you. And so I have to pump the brakes a little bit and be differentiated around that and recognize that I shouldn't make any rash decisions right now. And I should tend to my primary partner, even though I'm not compelled to do so right now, because I don't want to hurt my primary partner, because in all likelihood, six months from now, the NRE is going to go away. And I'm probably still going to want to be with my primary partner. So there's all that kind of stuff. Or the primary partner will look at the other person and experiencing them having a lot of infatuation love and also frame it as, oh, well, they're having NRE. Good for them. But, you know, it doesn't last forever because it usually doesn't. So that's one thing that they will do. Um, the other thing that polyamorous couples will do is they will have stipulations. They will, they will, there's all these different gradations. They will say, look, you can date someone having multiple dates, but you cannot fall deeply in like or love with them. That's my boundary. And I won't as well or whatever, because that will destroy me. I'm okay with you being with other people sexually, but I don't, or even I don't want you to be with the same person twice or something like that. There's a lot of you know, ways of, of managing that. I, I had a couple once where the wife had a stipulation to the husband the husband couldn't be with anyone of her ethnicity because she wanted to be the only person of that ethnicity in his life. So, and, and we explored that because it was worth exploring. And at the end of that exploration, she's just like, yeah, I, I just, there's no way I'm going to be able to cope with that. And it doesn't, it's not logical, right? But it, it is how she felt. And so that was a rule and you know, you can have those kinds of rules. Um, but the, the, other th the other thing I'm hearing from Destiny is you're, you're like caught between a rock and a hard place you're like worried about what would, what would happen. And, but on the other hand, but if, and if you go with the worries, then you phrase it as I'm just going to push down the fantasy and remain monogamous. You know, that can cause a lot of issues, right? But 
I will also say that a lot of polyamorous people who are oriented that way can manage monogamous relationships fine. So, you know, it's not a, it's not a disaster. There, it's worthy of ex exploration and it might take you 10 years to really get to a solid place. So, you know, go down that journey. Uh, Kim and Usman, so Cat Effects Art, by the way, is a great YouTube commenter who actually will code different timestamps on the videos. And when she, uh, she I, I've actually have an agreement with her now that she'll email me when she does that and actually pin her comment to the top. So uh, everyone thank Cat Effects, Cat Effects Art for doing that service for you because <laughs> I'm too busy to do that kind of stuff. Hey, Dr. Hunter, I remember watching that first video you mentioned with Tom Darcy and Lisa and Usman two years ago. Our country was locked down during the time, and I had just come back from a trip to the U.S. where my friend introduced me to 90 Day Fiance. I have been back here since the first, I, I have been I have been here on your YouTube channel since the first 90 day reaction video. Looking back, you've come a long way in the way you make your reaction videos. You're now more careful and thorough and also more invested. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's actually embarrassing to, for me to watch the initial reaction videos that I made because I didn't have any equipment. I, I, I've always been sort of against webcams for some reason, I, you know, I, I use a desktop computer, and so um, it took me a long time to even get a webcam, and I got one, and it was a kind of a cheap one, and it wasn't very good, and my background was kind of wonky and stuff, and so it's it's embarrassing to look at, yeah. Um, DDD, I remember you saying you didn't understand why anyone would watch this kind of TV, reality TV, and I was feeling slightly called out, but also slightly agreeing, LOL. Did I really? Did I really call? Did I really say that I didn't understand why anyone would watch reality TV? I mean, it doesn't really sound like me. But if I said that, that's awful. That's really judgmental. Like, why would I yuck someone's yum? That's really dumb. So, my apologies. Um, a long time and many reaction videos after that. Well, so I think what it came from was I've never watched reality TV. I probably said something like that. Like. I've never watched reality TV, and I don't really understand why anyone does watch it. <laughs> but that's not me saying, why would anyone watch this crap? It's just more like, huh? I'm just confused. Because it's a whole, over time I've learned that there's a whole kind of language system or a, there's all these assumptions that we're at, we as a view, viewing audience are supposed to know before watching a, rea a reality TV show. And if you're if you're unfamiliar with all those unwritten rules when you're watching, you're like, what am I watching? I don't understand. Why, why is this happening? So there's that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I in my you know, I'm 51, so I'm old enough to remember when reality TV was invented. I mean, you could argue it goes back to other kinds of projects like Seven Up, which I love, by the way, um, all those films. But the way people will talk about reality TV is it began on MTV with the real life. And I, I, I remember watching that show the very first season. And I, I don't think I ever watched it after that. Cause I, you know, in my twenties and thirties and forties, <laughs> I never really watched a lot of TV for uh, various reasons. One, I, d I couldn't afford cable TV. So I was using bunny ears. I had a really crappy, I couldn't afford a good TV. Um, you know, just all that kind of stuff. So I had other things that I was doing with my life when the internet came around. Um, oh, and I, I love movies. And so when Netflix came out, I started renting DVDs. And so I primarily watched through DVDs and that's a very curated experience. I feel like reality TV is something you just sort of, you just sort of flip through the channel, you sort of turn on, you're just like, okay, you know, I'll watch this. I never really, I'm also like really meticulous about my time and I, I hate, wasting my time and I feel like when I watch a show that I'm only halfway into I feel like I'm really wasting my time and so I think that steered me away from reality TV but I did watch one season of the the real life that's what it's called right I think it was in New York and the one with Puck I remember Puck being a divisive character and then someone had HIV that might have died later anyway and the other reality TV show I watched was 
um, Rock of Love second season because a friend of mine was watching it, and so I watched it with them and liked it with the guy from Poison. What's his name? Neil something. And I remember liking that show. And oh, and I watched another reality. You just think about all the seasons of reality TV that have been over, that have been on the air over the past 30 years. And I've watched three different seasons. I, and I barely watched The Real Life because I would just catch it sometimes. But I watched Rock of Love 2. Uh, and I watched um, one, the first season of, God, what was it? They were, it was uh, this show that was trying to create another girl band like Destiny's Child. And there were women that were auditioning their singing talents and their dancing talents and their modeling talents. And they, uh, this would have been, I don't know, around the year 2000 or something. And uh, five women, I believe. And the name of the band was something, I can't remember. Anyway, um, to the point where I actually bought that CD and actually liked a couple of the songs on that album. <laughs> And I think that's it. I think that's all that I've watched. So anyway, point is, is that when I started watching it, because y'all were asking me to, I was just like, what am I, what am I doing? <laughs> um, but Cat FX Art goes on to say, a long time and many reaction videos after that, you've come to understand and you appreciate this kind of TV, which I do. Uh, I really do appreciate it because as, I think I've said this before, but as a professor, I am frequently lamenting how few video resources we have in our field that demonstrate what we're talking about. For example, if I'm lecturing about attachment theory or a different therapy technique, there are videos out there, but they're usually terrible or really out of date, or there's actors who are acting like clients and it's obvious that they're acting like clients. Whereas with reality TV, as you can tell, there's a lot of data there to provide as a backdrop for these concepts that I have always wanted an example to be shown to people. You know, it's one thing to describe something. It's another thing to be like, that's preoccupied attachment. Um, uh, dee -dee -dee, when you said that, I remember feeling a sense when I was saying that I appreciate it. When you said that, I remember feeling a sense of validation and telling my now ex-husband about it too. You become a staple of my life during the past two years. I watch every video that you post even if I don't watch any of the shows anymore, how do you feel about your journey? Yeah, that's interesting. Some people will say, I don't watch the shows anymore, but I do watch your videos. Yeah, I think sometimes you could probably get the gist of the season because I tend to not include the fluff stuff. But although I'm sure there are some scenes that you would actually really want to watch if anyway. Um, how do I feel about my journey? Well, I've, I've gone really long with my commentary thus far and my wife watches all these videos to review them and I always feel really bad when I talk too much because then she has to sit through me talking the whole time so I'll try to be brief. Cat FX Art, how do I feel about my journey? I feel grateful about my journey for being able to have the opportunity to use this platform to enact the purpose of my life was to is try to make a positive difference in the world. So, and I'm grateful for y'all for even paying attention to what I'm saying. It feels, it feels good to be able to enact the purpose of my life. <laughs> I don't know any way to put it. Liga says, I have watched so many of Dr. Kirk Honda's videos over the past few days that I had a dream about him and even your presence in the stream was so soothing, calm, and accepting and therapeutic that I feel like I should pay you for that. <laughs> yeah. So by the way, if you ever have a dream about me, I, I find that to be fine. You know, people think, oh, is that creepy? It's not creepy. Uh, if I watch a YouTube channel or listen to a podcast or watch a TV show, you know, those personas, those, those people are internalized and they will be subjects in my dreams. It's just natural that that will happen. So. Uh, it almost makes me, particularly if you have a good dream about me, it makes me feel like there's a possibility that also I'm enacting the purpose of my life because you have internalized me and that internalization, which is a part of you, it's not me. Like when you dreamt about me, like, like uh, it, it wasn't actually me. You were actually, rep, you had a, there's a part of you that that is now, that is, uh, that is now it, in the dream was represented by an image of me. but. 
the soothe, you know, you were soothed by an image of me in your dream, but in reality, what was happening is a part of you was soothing yourself. And uh, that's important to recognize, I think, a, a lot of times. But anyway, so, you know, if you ever dream about me, and if I ever dream about you, I'll tell you. How about that? <laughs> you don't have to tell me, but if you, because like I said, some people will be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry, is that creepy? And I'm like, no, it's fine. Paulina says, thank you for your analysis on emotional connections persisting even after the relationship has ended. I've always felt like there's something wrong with me because it's often difficult for me to get over relationships. People make it sound like it's easy to cut emotional ties and that's not my reality. I'm glad to hear that there's nothing wrong with me. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I would take a guess and say that most people who are saying that um, it's easy for them to cut emotional ties, that they're in denial, that it actually isn't that easy. So that's just a guess, but who knows. Discordia says, I have never had a therapist be able to explain the phenomenon of transitioning to a new partner the way Dr. Honda has. I was with someone for 14 years and had a very traumatic breakup. It was like my ex-partner haunted my every waking moment for years afterwards. My mind would see my old partner when looking at my new husband, which would disorient and terrify me. Right, so I was talking about how it, I, would, I won't rehash it, but in a nutshell, when we bond with someone and we are attached to someone, our neurons literally change to associate everything about that person to that feeling. And when we break up and we recouple with someone else, those neurons don't change overnight, that we still will associate. When we feel that feeling of closeness with our new partner, it fires a lot of associations that are associated with that previous partner. And you might have an urge to call them by that previous partner's name, or you literally might even sort of see your previous partner over them because those neurons are now being uh, uh, you know, engaged. So it's, it's not you holding on to the past or doesn't mean you're still in love with that previous person. It's just, it's just neurons that are taking a while to, to change. It, you know, our brains are plastic, but not that plastic. Stephanie says, I dated a guy from Guinea and I'm seeing a lot of the things that you're saying about Usman in terms of sexism that I didn't cheat on you. So why are we talking about this attitude that he has as if that's the only decency I deserved and I should be happy. This video that you talked about, Dr. Han, it helped me realize that deep-rooted sexism was at play here. Yeah, it's something that I don't think we often get a chance to talk about, but we all understand that sexism is, is in perhaps every culture, and some cultures have it particularly bad, right? And when you got it particularly bad, the notions and the propaganda and the belief system that is present in individuals can be really... Um, stark and when you see it, you're like huh and it's possible that with Usman we were seeing that that he is operating from a, a very highly sexist culture I mean any culture that has this practice where the pinnacle of a man is to have several wives and it's not the opposite <laughs> and women can never date you know, never be with multiple men. You just have to say, I mean, that's a, a lot of evidence that there's something deeply wrong with that, with that. Not just, not, there's nothing wrong with polyamory, but there is something wrong with like, only men can be polyamorous essentially, like yikes. So might Usman be operating from that place when Kim was complaining in a very understandable way and Usman's like, what's the big deal? Like, I'm not cheating on you, uh, like, get off my back, it's like, that's all I deserve is that you just don't cheat on me. <laughs> like, uh, I don't deserve care or respect or uh, you not lying to me or you caring about my feelings. Like, uh, yeah. Destiny says, my first therapy session is literally today because of you. So thank you, Dr. Anna. Great. Warms my heart, Destiny. I'm glad you're going to therapy. By the way, if you use... Better help, you know, use the promo code Kirk because it helps us out. But also understand, I, I was thinking about this while I was, um, what was I doing? I was by the sink, anyway, in the kitchen. But I was thinking that if I were to recommend that you go online and find a therapist, like you go to a therapist directory in your town, there's a chance that you're gonna find an excellent therapist, like a once in a lifetime kind of therapy relationship. There's a chance you're gonna find a good enough therapist, but not amazing. And there's a chance you're gonna find 
a, an incompatible therapist, and there's a small chance you're going to find a, an abusive therapist, someone that is just bad and harmful. So there's all four of those categories. Excellent, good enough, um, not a good fit, and abusive to you. All four of those possibilities are true whenever you're looking in the phone book or going online. Psychology Today has a database of therapists in your area. The same is true with BetterHelp, that there's a chance you're going to find the therapist of a lifetime, a good enough therapist, a incompatible therapist, and an abusive therapist. It's all there because there's no way for better help, or at least it's not their policy, to somehow vet that. Plus, sometimes it's just a fit thing. So um, understand that. And I say that because if you use BetterHelp or whatever you use and whatever promo code you use and your first therapist is like, you know, like try to, after five sessions, you should probably, you'd probably have a good idea of where they were in, in those four categories. If they are incompatible or abusive, obviously change. It doesn't mean that all better help therapists are going to be that way because it's the same, the same sort of roll the dice is true in real life or, you know, not online. Uh, but also, if you have a good enough therapist, you could jump ship and try to find the perfect therapist. Or you're like, well, you know, it's good enough, meets my needs for today. It's not, it's not like that previous therapist I had, but, you know, it's good enough. That's a decision that you're going to make. If you find the therapist of a lifetime, hold on to them tight. Because <laughs> like, it's hard to find that person. It, it's, not, it's not impossibly hard, but it is hard. And so... Um, yeah, so Destiny, regardless of where you're going for therapy, you know, think about that because sometimes people will say, okay, I finally went to therapy. And then a year later, they're like, yeah, I went. It was, it was just kind of a dud, so I never went back to therapy. And I'm like, oh, no, like, you know, keep going. Uh, Mike and Jimena, Denicia, uh, emailed in and said, I am interested in why Mike should be able to say goodbye to Jimena's sons. Right, so I was... I think talking about how it's fine if they want to, that Mike would be able to say goodbye to the kids for the kids' sake, that that transition would help the kids to be able to emotionally deal with the loss because for the kids, I, I'm guessing they at least to some extent were attached to Mike. They were told he was going to be dad and they were going to live with him and he was da-da-da. And my impression was that Mike and the kids had bonded and had spent, spent time together. It didn't seem like a deep bond because there wasn't a lot of time there, but you know, it was there. And there are a lot of situations where I will talk to kids or adults who had experiences when they were growing up where they would meet their, their parents, you know, dating partners. And then one day that per, and they bond with that person. And then one day that person's just gone and they're like, and it hurts, you know, and kids aren't necessarily going to say anything. They might be like, oh, where's Mike? But they're not going to say, I'm hurting on the inside because I can't see Mike. You know, they might, but they probably won't. But the damage is, is happening. Not always, but it often can. So I was contending that it might be a good idea if Mike were able to say goodbye to the kids along those lines. Denicia says, I'm interested in why Mike should be able to say goodbye to Jimena's sons. As someone who witnessed domestic abuse as a child, I know that fear of a man yelling and not leaving, thankfully, I, I know the fear of a man yelling and not leaving. Thankfully, we got out safely when I was a child. I'm, I majored in, a, in early childhood development and see this as a lesson in unacceptable behavior and not put the kids in an awkward position of saying goodbye. Right, so I think what you're saying, Denicia, is for you, when you saw your parent being abused by someone and there was perhaps he or they or she wanted to say goodbye to you when or some kind of contact with you, but your parent actually drew a boundary with that person and you weren't a, they weren't able to say goodbye to you and you didn't want to say goodbye to them, that not allowing that contact with you was actually a good thing for you. Absolutely. That can absolutely be true. And I guess I should have mentioned that in, in, in the video. But to say that in all situations with an abusive individual 
when an abusive individual is being excised from a family with children, that it's always a bad idea for that person to be able to say goodbye to the kids is, is you know, just an oversimplification. Should we all, should, when we're in that situation, consider the pros and the cons of that? Should we consider the safety of that? Absolutely. So, you know, that's what I'll say about that. But I'm sorry you went through that, Denicia. I'm, I'm hoping that you're able to heal from that. It sounds really, really scary when you're a kid. That's really awful. And just along those lines, like with Jimena's kids, like, oh, I mean, the who knows what they went through prior to Mike being involved and who knows what's going to happen after. You just have to hope for the best. All right. Well, hopefully my wife won't be too upset at the length of this. How long is it? <laughs> I think it's pretty long. But anyway, <laughs> If you care to, you can thank my wife in the comments below for uh, being in the background of a lot of this podcast effort. And by the by the way, people are like, why can't why can't I have the wife? Why don't you have the wife on the show? I have tried. I've been podcasting for many many years, and I have frequently tried to get her on the podcast, and she utterly refuses. Like there, I'm a, I can you know I've really there have been moments where I'm like, oh, and she's just like, no. Uh, I mean, she doesn't say it like that. She's just like, no, thank you. Anyway, so yeah. Anyway, everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.